heard John Donne. I really heard it as a young person. I heard that the death of every man diminishes me. I heard it. I don't mean in my ears. I heard it somewhere behind my kneecap. I heard it. I heard, don't ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee, fool. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I, I, I'm blessed in that I did, I, I was moved in the, you know, by the works of other people. And I do believe that there's nothing human that can be alien to me. And if people, if they want to think that it is, that's their problem. Now, I'm going to move over them, and if it means really walking on them, I will do so. speak French. French is my second language now. At one time it was Spanish. It depends on where I am really. I'm very fickle. Uh, if I'm, I've been most recently speaking French, so it's, it's my second language. I speak Spanish, Italian, Arabic. Arabic used to be a second language when I lived in Egypt. And that's Did interesting. Well, all right. In Egypt, I worked in Egypt as a associate editor of the Arab Observer. It was the only English news weekly in the Middle East. And there were only two Americans in the Middle East in the communications media, and that was Dr. Du Bois' son, David Du Bois, who's still there, and, uh, and me. I found myself as an executive in a magazine, on a magazine, with only men working under me as female, non-Muslim, non-Arab, black, six feet tall, and an American. <laughs> the only thing more I could have been is Jewish, and I would have been that. So um, there were, that one learned to be not evasive so much as delicate. You know? <laughs> and I was fortunate. I got some work done I'm proud of. I learned a lot. For one thing, the, the uh, guys who set type were literate in, in Arabic, in the Arabic lettering. So after working all week, the magazine would come out. I'd be on my way to the office, and Arab would be spelled A, and the R would be facing east. And the V would be up like that. So I'd rush. Of course, that's, that's finished. So I learned to set type with something like tweezers, you know, write the stuff, rewrite it, lay out, uh, work with the layout people, copy and so forth, and then go down in the basement and turn <laughs> the things right. So it was a great experience for me. I'm very pleased. In, uh, in Ghana, I worked at the University of Ghana as um, assistant administrator of the Faculty of Music and Drama. And I wrote for Ghanaian Radio and the Ghanaian Times. And I found myself at home for the first time in my life in Ghana, the first time. Because in Arkansas, I had been known as Sister Henderson's granddaughter, California granddaughter, since we'd come from, we'd gone there when I was three years old. But so, small town people do not forget. So I never became, to them, a person from the town. I was still Sister Henderson's California granddaughter. I went to California, and I was a southern girl. I went to New York to study, and I was the Westerner. I never really belonged anywhere till I got to West Africa, to Ghana. And it was paradise enough for me. I'm in the States because I think I have something to say. And uh, I wouldn't be happy in paradise just now. The only place for a good, I mean good, for a responsible person in evil times is in jail or on a platform. So I, I must be saying what I'm saying. So that's why I really I'm standing here. Okay, let's have another one. Yes.
Well, it's so tragic, you see. Egypt, Egypt has a history that's exciting in its oppression. Until Nasser, Egypt had been controlled by everybody for 2,000 years except an Egyptian. The Turks, the Sudanese, the Ethiopians, the French, the, Amer the English, the British rather. Everybody has controlled Egypt. And suddenly, even uh, the Farouk comes from a Turkish family. That's a Turkish line. Uh, Nasser, in a small book that was published early, the, I guess late 50s, called Anatomy of a Revolution, said that he was going, he's the first person I remember using this phrase, he said he was going to pull his people from the 14th century into the 20th. And if you see in Egypt the same um, arg uh, agricultural tools of, oh, the Middle Ages, and the same kind of thinking. So that here are people who are colonized in their minds, you see. The, the women are still objects of derision for use for sexual exploitation and any other kind of exploitation. And not realizing, so the exploiter doesn't realize that while he's exploiting the women, he is being cooperatives so that uh, maybe 50 farms could use um, the equipment, you see, and it started a chain, and then people took mobile, uh, mobile um, libraries to the country, to the bush, and people started to become more and more literate. So it has changed, I mean, when I left, I was last there about four years ago, four, five years ago, and it had changed somewhat. 60 and 60, 60, 61, some of 62, early 62. Yes, ma'am. None at all. Well, I, I mean, but I think that I've been very fortunate, you see. I believe that all knowledge is spendable currency depending upon the market. There's no such animal as useless information. You may not be able to use it immediately, but if you can learn something, do so. I think, though, that an, an educational institution has a value in two ways only. It hones the mental machine, hones it, and it stores, if you try, it stores information. Now, with those two factors, with a sharp mental machine, and the, the material, you can educate yourself, obviously. That is the best, the best kind of inter in educational institution can do. And hopefully, a teacher, if a teacher is, is good, and there are very, very few good teachers, if a teacher is good, he or she stimulates you to pack in the stuff in the whole.
But if you have the material, or you have honed that machine, and know that it is not bad to be ignorant, it's only bad to stay that way. That's the only thing wrong. Yes, please. Well, I, I haven't used it in some time, and I'm used to using mobile. And when I thought of mobile, I thought, no, that means my, my machine is moving fast, too. And I was thinking, no, that means that art object, that, uh, you know, thing. So <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Sorry. There's someone behind me. Yes, sir. Didn't you have your hand in the pink shirt? Sorry. Yes, sir. Well, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, I guess, more than anybody else. Langston Hughes, County Cullen. Mr. Arna Bonton. Uh, delicious man. Um, Sterling Brown. Uh, white writers, I was very impressed with Edgar Allan Poe. That, that internal rhyme that he's able to achieve is just so wonderful. Um, poets, particularly now. Um, naturally, Shakespeare really impressed me a great deal. Uh, I was, I'm impressed by Lorca, a Spanish poet, and Pablo, Pablo Neruda, a Spanish poet. I mean, Spanish-speaking poet. Mm. I was always impressed with our music, really. I was very fortunate because I had a grandmother who sang. And every Sunday, my grandmother was the mother of the church. So every Sunday, she'd sit down in church. And like this was the altar. My grandmother sat like this. The altar's up there. And the minister, every Sunday, would say, and now we'll be led in a hymn by Sister Henderson. <laughs> ashamed of my music. And I know that there were people, after I came to California, there were people who, you'd hear people singing, and they'd say, oh, stop that. That's, oof. Why don't you put on, uh, oh, sweet mystery of life at last upon you. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so, so that really was, was my blessing. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I have many, many heroes, many. And I meet, I'm just today, four young people brought us to the, to the school. And I realize that my new heroes are the young people. They really are. They really are. They, when I'm most depressed, I can think of them and think, well, yeah, it's not all that bad. It's, it, it, we, we stand a chance when I look at them. So I, I make heroes, I mean, I, and I honor them too. Yes, sir. Not really. Um, it's a good question. The black American came from societies which were religious. In slavery, 
he was denied the chance to propitiate his gods. But he was by nature a religious person. Now, African religions called by sociologists and anthropologists and people I like to call hysteriologists, uh, uh, called animism, animistic, because it's ancestor worship. Those religions included the possibility of a god being hermaphroditic. So, uh, Nyame, uh, God, could split himself in two and become female and male. Now, when a person comes from a society which has that as its, found, as its foundation, certainly that person is, does not have to strain his imagination to think about uh, Ezekiel going to heaven on a chariot wheel. The very idea that Mary was a, a, a virgin did not strain his imagination at all. He had that ability to believe. He didn't have to suspend disbelief, you see. What is now young people, blacks and whites, call soul and soulfulness and so forth is the ability to believe in something larger than oneself. And the black man is by nature a believer. If that were not so, we would not have survived. I don't mean in God as such, but believing, trusting, having faith. Adam Clayton Powell was not playing when he said, keep the faith, baby. It's used very superficially by people who don't understand it. That's a very profound statement. So what kind of religions? There are black people now in Islam, black Americans studying Islam and very serious people, Christianity, naturally, atheist, atheistic, agnostics, very, very holy people, I think, without romanticizing them. I see that great belief, that ability to believe as, a, as a, an effort which is religious. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'd, I'd rather, I'd like to read more. I mean, I, I think that there are many things that are sensual. Hmm. I don't know. I, I dare not uh, comment on his position without, I, I, I know that there are many, we are people given to sensuality. I don't know if everything, that sounds very Freudian to me, which does not necessarily mean bad, it's just Freudian. And, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very, very much. Thank you indeed. Thank you. We're ending it now because, as Miss Angelo put it very aptly this afternoon, we have to conserve and protect and soothe our heroes, our black poets and our musicians and preachers and such. And she will be at the Black House immediately following this and everyone is welcome. I'd like to thank Greek Week Incorporated, the Lectures Committee, SOUL, BSO, and BCC for the donations for getting these speakers here for all this week. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>